so I think they do need to go back to school. We have to do it with caution. I think it can be done. It'll take creativity. It'll take a little bit of effort on the part of the educators to get their kids uh, back to school, but I think it needs to be done earlier rather than later. Well, hello friends. Uh, my name is Bob Hamilton. I'm a pediatrician from Santa Monica. I've been in pediatric practice for over 35 years here in Santa Monica, and uh, we're all in the middle of this coronavirus uh, epidemic, and we're trying to figure out how to work our way through it. We're all in this together. As a pediatrician, are you seeing children dying because of the coronavirus? Um, <laughs> the short answer is no. Uh, the but let me back up a little bit and kind of talk about that. The good news about coronavirus is that this virus, for whatever reason, and when I'm, I'm not sure anyone really knows a good reason, but it, it is children are actually handling it quite well. Uh, the number of, of cases of coronavirus in children, I'm talking about children being ages 0 to 18, is actually relatively low. They, they have done studies uh, showing, um, you know, that, you know, the people who have been infected, they did one particular study where there was 150,000 people evaluated. Of that group, only 1.7% of them were actually children. Again, I'm calling children, some of these are teenagers, so they're in the zero to 18 age category. That says a lot about the the, the goodness. If you're, there's a silver cloud to this uh, whole uh, epidemic is the fact that children are not being infected like adults. I, I shudder to think, uh, Will, what would actually, how we would be feeling right now if in fact children were impacted to the same level that adults are, you know, older adults are being impacted. That would be, a, we would be living in a different world. And the paranoia that we feel right now and the, and the anxiety we feel uh, would be heightened by a logarithmic um, level, right? Of that, of that 1.7% of that 150,000, I mean, did any of those children die or have really serious cases of coronavirus? In that particular study, no one died. And what you're finding is there are rare, and I'm talking about very, very rare uh, cases where children have died. Uh, I heard of one kid in Michigan uh, was a child of early responders. Both the parents, mother and father, were early responders, and that child got it and, and actually passed. Uh, but I can I can tell you that really worldwide, worldwide, you know, going to, you know China and Italy and all over the world where this is impacting people, uh, Iran, uh, Europe, the number of children who've actually uh, died uh, is really you can count them on you know one or two hands seriously. Now um, of the you know the re the reality though is that uh, so the answer to your question are children dying. Yes, <clears throat> there have been a, a handful of children who have in fact died. But are they, are they dying like older people are dying? Thank God, no. In the New York Times today, you were showing me an article about one of the main concerns is that children will be maybe carriers yeah. of the virus for people. Can you elaborate sure. on that? Well, I mean, uh, going back to the study I just referred to, of the children, of that 1.7% of children who are infected, I will tell you the majority of them, about 68% of them, are asymptomatic. Okay. In other words, they, they have the virus when they're cultured, they have the virus, they have no symptomatology, no fever, no coughing, no the usual things that you think about in an adult uh, population. They're asymptomatic. So people are kind of going, oh my gosh, these little children are running around. And listen, we can't, uh, we can't, treat children like they're uh, bubonic plague rodents, okay? They're, they're not that. But they are, they are asymptomatic, and this is a major concern for people in terms of when you open up schools and when you get back to normal life. Um, we'll talk about that maybe in a, in a minute or two, but the reality is that uh, children, yes, they do harbor the virus, uh, yes, they can potentially be, uh, they, can, they can share that virus. When you have a virus, you can share it. And certainly parents of, of children know that when their kids start going to daycare and, and preschool and, and elementary school, suddenly they're getting sicker at a higher level than they ever have in their life because they have children and their children bring it home to them. And so we have to be mindful of that. At the same time, we, we also have to be mindful of the fact that the number of children who are actually getting infected is, is very low. To me, it seems like if these children are asymptomatic already, 
and not many of them are getting sick. It seems to me like the best course of action would be to open up the schools. I mean, there, there, there really isn't a reason to keep them closed because this virus, as it seems, is, is going to be around for a while. You know, right? And if the children aren't dying, I mean, you have to get these kids back to school. Would you? Would you agree? I, I actually agree with that, and I I will tell you why. I think that listen, we have to do this with with an abundance of caution. We have to be smart. We have to be mindful of the fact that there this virus does infect children, albeit at a very low level. And but I think that I'm I'm thinking about the other effects that this is having on children. Okay, there are many of the, the young elementary school, even preschool kids are going to school on like a Zoom or a, you know, a Skype or whatever they're doing uh, via the internet. <laughs> it is, in, is inadequate and it's very inferior. And you talk to mothers and fathers who, whose children are engaged in this experiment, if you will. Uh, and, and I don't say that. I, I think that the teachers are doing a phenomenal job. The school districts and the private schools out there are doing everything they can possibly do to mean that, maintain that continuity of academic, um, you know, progress, if you will. But it, it's almost impossible to do that. And everyone knows that the education, even, listen, I talk to my families who, whose children go to elite private schools here on the west side of Los Angeles. And I ask them, I, I point blank, I say, are your children getting the quality education that they were getting before? And they look at me and they smile and they go, of course not. No, they're not. So I, I do, I'm concerned about that. And I, but I think, so I think they do need to go back to school. We have to do it with caution. I think it can be done. I think if we creatively think about how do you do that? Well, I mean, you may have to divide the day into two and have a morning session, an afternoon session. Maybe you go every other day. Um, the problem is a lot of schools can't, you know, when you talk about social distancing, that will probably need to be done in schools to a degree. Um, but you have to, you can't, if you have a, a classroom of 30 kids, well, there's not enough actual geography in that classroom to handle 30 kids separated. If you divide the, the day into two halves, you have 15 kids per classroom, that can probably be done. So it'll take creativity. It'll take a little bit of effort on the part of the educators to get their kids uh, back to school, but I think it needs to be done earlier rather than later. Well, they're missing out on social skills too. Many of them are sitting at home and eating tons of junk food, comfort food, things like that. My sister is actually a school yeah. teacher in, in Colorado, yeah. and so she's working with these students on Zoom. She's in a more underprivileged type of school and these kids aren't showing up for classes and they're not engaged or you know they don't have access to high speed internet anything like that you were talking to me about high school students yeah i mean to that to that point will i mean there was a article that came out in the los angeles times a, a week or two ago about what is going on in the la unified school district and would they went they actually closed their schools on march 16th and they went to an online education uh paradigm so 15,000 of their high school kids have not checked in. Another 40,000, okay, which represents one third, one third of their student body and high school student body, only check in rarely. They're not checking in on a daily basis. They're not really doing, you know, listen, to get educated requires discipline. If you're kind of checking in willy nilly, are you going to get educated? The answer is, is no, of course. And so I'm concerned about this. I, I am concerned about what is happening to our kids, uh, educational wise. And so we have to, we have to figure out a way to get our kids back into the education stream. If we don't, they're going to lose, they're going to lose a full year of education. And, and, you know, for some kids, they're not going to be able to make it up. And I, I'm thinking in particular, the kids who are not showing up are, to, to the internet, you know, education uh, program are kids who, who typically come from the lower socioeconomic categories, who don't have access to home computers, who don't have access to high-speed internet. So they're, they're not, it isn't that they're bad kids, they just simply don't have the access that other kids may have. And this isn't just happening in LA, I mean, this is happening all over the country, and I'm sure all over the world, really, where they're doing online classes, but we've seen some countries right now, Israel, I believe France, the Netherlands, Denmark, who are, the UK, who are looking Germany, to, Germany, Germany as yeah. well, who are looking to, to start opening up 
their schools. They're going back. And I, and I think that they realize, like we realize, I mean, all the educators who are out there listening to this right now, we all know that there, there is something needs to be done. So they realize that this is a big hole. By the way, in addition to when you're hanging around all day in your home, in your quarantine, what do you do when you're a kid? I mean, kids, what do kids like to do? They like to run around. They like to play. They're getting, this is having a mental, uh, emotional effect on them. Uh, studies out of China are showing that these kids who have been quarantined for long periods of time are scoring much higher on uh, on depression d d depression scales. Okay, when they do these studies, so no, they and they're also I can tell you that they're getting they're anxious. They're they're getting a little paranoid. Frankly, uh, their world has been turned upside down. Suddenly, everybody's wearing a mask. Everyone's avoiding everybody. You can only imagine, you know, young children, they're very concrete in their thinking. So this is having a, an emotional toll on them too. And we're, we are social animals. We need each other. We need to have social contact. I, 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 an aside here, I, I saw a friend of mine who uh, is fine. He's healthy. He's okay. And I said, I, I told him, I said, give me a hug. And we gave each other a hug. I got to tell you, I, don't, I haven't been hugging very many people lately. It felt so good. <laughs> to have that kind of just, you know, shake his hand and give him a hug. It was so, it was like, oh, wow, this is like something I, I needed that. It was good for my, my soul. Uh, and children need it too. They, they love their friends. They love to play. They love to run around, scream, and, you know, have fun. And they should be. So we need to, we need to be creative. We need to be wise. We need to do this with an abundance of caution. But we need to do it. And we can do it. I'm expecting a hug, first of all, after the, the end of this <laughs> interview. Do you, and, have, uh, do you have COVID or not? I'm, 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 <laughs> who knows? You, who you, knows you look point. suspicious to me, Will. The bandana. Everything. Okay, the bandana, yes. In terms of another article from the New York Times, we love the New York Times yeah. over here, was talking about a new phenomenon. Yep. And, uh, you were talking about Kawasaki's disease, or it has Kawasaki's disease type symptoms. And yep. they're saying that it may be linked to coronavirus. Could you talk about this? Sure. I mean, this is concerning. And uh, this is brand new. Uh, it came out in the last week or two. And what they're, Kawasaki, first of all, is a, uh, a, a disease syndrome that happens. We don't really know why. I mean, it, had, it does have clustering, um, cl uh, cases clustered. And, and we think possibly is due to a viral infection. Historically, we've thought that. We have not been able to pin a particular virus. Maybe... Part of the, uh, the, the course we're on in the, this journey through COVID, well, maybe we'll figure out that, that the Kawasaki is, is related to coronavirus. And, uh, but anyway, the, uh, basically Kawasaki's, uh, shows up with, you know, fevers for, for over several days. They have inflammation of their eyes. They have red eyes. They have large swollen glands. They have a red tongue. They have lesions in their mouth. And the, the worrisome thing about Kawasaki is, is it has a deleterious effect on the coronary arteries uh, in children and those who get it, okay? Now, the re what that means, the, that effect I'm talking about is actually a dilation of the coronary arteries. The coronary arteries are the arteries that feed the heart. And clearly, if you have a disruption of the coronary arteries, any time in your life, that's worrisome because that means that the heart is not getting fed the, the, the healthy blood and oxygen and everything else that goes along with it. So we worry about that. Um, right now, there have been uh, about, I mean, initially it was like 15, but now we're up to about 48, uh, 64, around that range, uh, more uh, cases of what we call this Kawasaki-like syndrome. We're calling it the pediatric um uh, multi-system inflammatory syndrome, okay? And so uh, a large name, but basically they're showing up, they have, they have Kawasaki's like uh, manifestation, fever, the red, the red tongue. Um, they also, some of them are actually uh, like shocky. Their, their, heart, their heart rate is uh, high, their blood pressure is low. So they're, this is a worrisome uh, development. And so we have to watch this. I, I mean, fortunately, it is showing up in very, very rarely. Uh, but if this becomes more, you know, evident out there, then I think we need to kind of say, okay, time out. We need to really, you know, find out what's going on here. 
Uh, they, they are just be, finding it in New York, though, right now, right? Well, I'm sure. No, they're finding it in throughout the the world. I think oh, the initial the cases wow. were in Europe, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. But the point is, is that if we see this as a trend, and uh, kids who, in fact, are by the way, going back to the, uh, the initial 15 who uh, who were reported a couple of days ago by the New York Times. Okay, of that 15, only four had COVID. Okay, so it isn't like. Is all comers. So we need to look at that. But if, in fact, we see a relationship between COVID and this Kawasaki-like syndrome, I think that that will put a, a little bit of a pause in, to all, all of us in the pediatric world, definitely in the education world, too, because I think this is something very concerning, right? So, but we'll, we're going we're gonna to work through that, too. And uh, right now, thankfully, again, this is extremely rare, and uh, to my knowledge, important uh, for people to know, there have not been any deaths as a result of this Kawasaki-like illness, to my knowledge. Well, that's great news, yeah. despite you know, horrible symptoms for these children to have. Yeah. In terms of, uh, you've done medical missions across the world yeah. and in different countries and actually deal with, with tons of infectious diseases all across the world, yes. in Sierra Leone and Colombia, things like that. Why is the coronavirus different than something like Ebola or SARS or something like that? Well, I think, I mean, you know, Ebola, of course, was a new virus that kind of came, actually not that new, it's been around for a while, but the it seems to kind of go underground and all of a sudden show up again. Um, I think coronavirus, the infectivity of it is very, very much higher than, say, Ebola or some of the others. I mean, not to say that they're not infectious. Now, thankfully, SARS was not that infectious, but it had a very high mortality rate. I think it was like 15% or something ridiculous. So if you if you got SARS, you were you were seriously uh, in trouble. Thankfully, it didn't. It was not that infectious, and they were able to contain that. Also, what they call MERS, which is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, that likewise was not quite as infectious. Um, I think the unique thing about uh, coronavirus is coronavirus. We don't know anything about it. It's kind of it, it's what I call a rogue virus. Okay, it kind of came out of nowhere. Now, mind you, coronavirus as a as a, a group. Okay, we've known about coronaviruses for a long time. We check for them all the time. Um, there are several subgroup, uh, several types of coronaviruses which cause viral infections in children. They have like a cold syndrome. So it isn't like we don't know about coronavirus, but this COVID is definitely what I call, the, some people call it a novel virus. I call it a rogue virus because it went completely, you know, AWOL here. And that, uh, and so the concern about this is that we don't know much about it. And I think that that is why people are looking at COVID differently. Okay, flu, for example, we have a lot of tools to fight flu. We have, we have a vaccine, number one. It doesn't work all the time, but we, we, give it, we, you know, we give it a shot. We have antiviral medications we can use for the flu. We also have rapid flu studies. I can do a flu uh, test on you in my office and have it done in five minutes. I can know what, you know, flu A, flu B, I can, I can give you a medicine and, and we kind of know about the flu. The thing about COVID, we have not too many of those tools right now. And we, we have really, we're kind of stepping into a new area. That's why there's such a, a concern about this virus. As we get to know more information, hopefully our anxiety will begin to go down. God willing, we'll have, I mean, there are several scores of, of groups who are working on a vaccine right now for, for COVID. Let, listen, uh, let's pray that they, they succeed in getting a, a very good COVID uh, vaccine. Um, and hopefully that will come sooner rather than later. Yeah, we've actually seen these massive companies come to work together to actually yeah. try and find a vaccine. So it seems like, I mean, despite horrible news, there's a lot of American success stories come out, coming out of this. And I've said yeah. that to all, pretty much all the people that I've interviewed. One of the, the other things is that, you know, I don't have children myself. I'm only 23 years old, but I know <laughs> a lot of, not yet, as I know of. But a lot of people I know do have kids. You know, a lot of people sure. work at PragerU and, and other places have children, and they're worried about, you know, going to a play date with another kid or going to summer camp or something like that. Do you think it's a good idea to allow children to play with other kids right now? I, I think, uh, Will, that this is my, my answer will be controversial. But basically, I, I do think they, they could. 
And the, that is, again, with caveats that you have to have the right people, that you, if you have friends, you have you know, kids or cousins or whatever, that you know the family, and you can ask the question, are you healthy? Are you well? And if the kids are well, listen, I think, you, I think the chance of really something bad happening of, your, of these children getting infected is really very low. So I would say, yeah. I mean, kids need to be with each other. They need to play. They need to run. They need to shout and throw balls and, and have a good time. Uh, I think also they should probably open playgrounds up again, too, because kids are being limited what they can do. And yes, you may have to go out there and, you know, clean the playgrounds or whatever, but I think it can be, I think we need to think about our children. We're forgetting about the children, uh, this demographic. One of the other big problems that I think we're going to see very soon is that you have these kids who aren't allowed to go back to school. All the schools are closed, but you have parents who now have to go back to work and what are we supposed to do with the kids? I mean, they can't go anywhere. The, the, the schools act somewhat as like a daycare for, for children sure, or summer camps sure. or anything like that, and they're all closed. Absolutely. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, schools really have been the, where, where parents send their kids, well, they go to work, okay? So this has been a blessing for people to have their kids in school. In fact, people, you know, want their kids to go to school more <laughs> because they can work. You know, it's a, it, summers are actually a challenge for a lot of people. Um, this is a big deal because as the economy begins to rev up again, and hopefully it will, people are going to go back to work. They're going to, and these people who have been furloughed or have been laid off for a period of time, hopefully they're going to go back into the workforce. We need to get people back. The unemployment uh, needs to go down again, right? And so what happens? Well, uh, kids, we can't leave kids at home. We can't leave them at home un unattended. I mean, that's, that can't happen. So we do need to have that provision. That's another reason why we need to get our schools and our parks and our, our you know, uh, camps uh, going again because we need to give that relief to parents. I know that when I was about 10 years old, if someone left me alone in the house, I would have burnt the whole thing down. So <laughs> definitely need people to watch these children right now. The last question that I want to ask is, is we've been asking everyone yeah. this question. So, you know, PragerU, with, with all these interviews we've done, we're very invested in getting the truth out there because the mainstream media and, and a lot of other people aren't putting out what's actually going on. If you had to say something that, that people don't know or that what the real truth is, what would you tell people? I think the big, the, big, um, the big issue for me would be that this demographic, children, are being overlooked in this whole epidemic. They're being forgotten. We're talking about the number of the older people and, and all the issues. And by the way, this is, a real, this is a real infection. This is a real disease. A lot of people tragically have died. But children are being overlooked. And the reality is that this is having a major effect on kids from their emotional uh, stress to their academic uh, falling behind and and also the fact that they're really not getting infected at the same level as adults by any means it is they're much much lower so i think that the big you know if i had to make one point is don't overlook the children they're important and we need to we need to look at them we need to deal with them we need to figure out a way to get them back to normal to normalize their life, to get them out of these apartments, out of their homes, interacting with each other again, back in school. Uh, and I can't imagine what will happen this summer if we don't do that. I totally agree. Thank you so much, Dr. Bob. I really pleasure. appreciate it. Thank My you guys pleasure. so much for watching. If you like this video, make sure you share with your friends, comment your thoughts down below, and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you. What's up, guys? Thank you so much for watching this video. PragerU is a 501c3 organization. Help us keep our videos free by making a tax-deductible donation today. I'd really appreciate your support.